You can pray until you faint. But if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. And it's no need of running and no need of saying, Honey, I'm not going to get in the mess. Black Power Talks. I'm Dr. Matsumilla Odom. And I'm Dexter M. Lemwingu. Uhuru means freedom in Swahili, and freedom is on our minds 24-7. On January 24th, 2019, Chairman Omalia Shetela of the African People's Socialist Party presented at Oxford University in Oxford, England. This address was delivered to the Oxford Union on the same floor that Malcolm X had addressed the world 55 years before, known as the Africa Debate. Speakers addressed the prompt, does Africa need an even closer union, or is it better off looking to the wider world? In his talk, Chairman Omalia Shetela argued in the affirmative with an important caveat. This union needs to be grounded in the leadership and advanced theory of the African working class. That leadership is not found in the neo-colonial African Union, but instead in the African Socialist International. That advanced theory is African internationalism. Chairman Omalia Shetela took African internationalism to the center of bourgeois academia and won. Most importantly, he has won the masses of African people. Chairman Omalia Shetela's Africa debate presentation has been viewed by tens of millions of African people. In August 2021, Talib Kweli shared a snippet of the speech on his Instagram page that has gained almost 50,000 views alone. The reach of the Africa debate reflects the five decades of political and theoretical influence of Chairman Amalia Shetela and African internationalism. Chairman Amalia has published more than a dozen books and founded the Burning Spear newspaper, the oldest African revolutionary journal in continuous print. In recent years alone, his writings and other African internationalist works have been cited in dozens of books, articles, and theses. This war of ideas has played a significant role in the resurgence of anti-colonial publications that have emerged. With the military defeat of the Black Power movement, an assault was made against the colonial question by reactionary forces and liberal left ideological imperialists alike. They told Africans that our primary struggle was to reform the racist superstructure, not destroy the colonial capitalist base. Malcolm X was amongst the earliest of African leaders to propose that colonialism was a primary contradiction that Africans in the U.S. faced. The colonial question was placed into concrete political organization through the philosophy of African internationalism. Universities function as a key part of the colonial capitalist superstructure. In universities, African people have been chopped up, literally, divided, and renamed in accordance to the general workings of colonial capitalism. The two largest divisions of this in universities are African studies and African-American studies. In recent decades, there has been an internationalist and all-African turn in the literature of many African scholars, namely those in the field of Africana studies, the field that I work in. I can personally attest to what Dexter just described because I have been a part of this journey. The introduction of my doctoral thesis acknowledges the leadership of African internationalism, and Chairman Omalia Shetela. And I have even been able to craft Africana Studies curricula to teach African internationalism to my students. I first encountered African internationalism through hip-hop music and the Burning Spear newspaper. 
After that, the multiple references to African internationalism, the African People's Socialist Party, and Chairman O'Malley Ashitella by the late Africana Studies scholar and African working class intellectual Rob Bush helped to guide my own journey. The on the ground upsurge of the African working class during this moment has brought this internationalism into these studies to the forefront. Today, we speak with Professor Layla Brown about a scholarship the COVID-19 pandemic, and the way forward. Professor Brown's work is emblematic of that anti-colonial turn, or might we say anti-colonial return, that has taken place in Africana studies. Professor Brown is trained as a cultural anthropologist, researcher, and educator. She earned her PhD from Duke University and specializes in the contemporary and historical study of social movements in the African diaspora. She places specific focus on African communities in the Americas, as well as African women liberation. She's an assistant professor of cultural anthropology in Africana studies at Northeastern University, but is currently a visiting professor in Germany. Professor Brown's recent research looks at the COVID-19 colonial virus pandemic, African resistance, and colonial domination. Her recent article, The Pandemic of Racial Capitalism, Another World is Possible, was published in From the European South. Uhu, Professor Leila, how you doing? I'm well, I'm well. How are you all? I'm I'm well, I'm well, I'm well. I'm glad to have you on the show. So, uh, Professor Brown, uh, how would you like us to refer to you? Professor, doctor? Please call me Layla. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dr. Brown is reserved for my students and white people who don't know better. So, uh, we're now two years into the pandemic with honestly no one in sight. When you first began the pandemic, if I'm correct, you were in South Africa as part of a fellowship program. How how mm-hmm. was that experience for you? Honestly, I, I'm i so glad that that's where I was. At first, I was a writing fellow, and then I was a visiting research fellow at the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Study. It's also where I was physically when I was able to write that pandemic of racial capitalism piece. In a lot of ways... In a very practical way, I was really shielded from the initial kind of loneliness of the pandemic because there were about 10 of us living in a compound together. And so because of the laws around quarantine and stuff, we essentially constituted a family. Um, And so we were able to have our own space, but also still able to be together. So I wasn't alone alone during that time, but it was also... Um, really fruitful in terms of my thinking, right? So to be able to, I had colleagues who have since become very close friends, um, one of whom is Dr. Olivia Rutazibwa, who's um, faculty at the London School of Economics. Uh, she's Rwandan um, by origin, uh, but grew up in Belgium. Another is Dr. Amaha Senu, who is, he's a professor of criminology uh, at Swansea University in the UK, but he's uh, Ethiopian. Um, and it was, a, it was a really nice opportunity to be able to live and think and work with other people who were concerned about the lives and works of, of African peoples around the globe. Um, and I think that that's not something that I get enough of in the U.S. Academy. And so it was a really good and productive time to think about Black African people in the world. I mm, appreciate that answer, Layla. I appreciate that. So during the pandemic, the South African government placed draconian laws into place that really targeted the African working class there. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us about those laws and how they impacted the African working class? For sure. So there were two cases in particular. So South Mm -hmm. Africa was one of, I think, maybe five countries that instituted a sale on the, I mean, sorry, a ban on the sale and consumption of um, alcohol as a, Mm. supposedly as a way of managing the pandemic. So the narrative is that alcoholism is a big problem in South Africa and that so many of the hospitals and clinics are overwhelmed by alcohol-related injuries, car accidents, you know, um, what are they, like f- issues with domestic violence. So the logic that they, that Cyril Ramaphosa, you know, utilized publicly was to say that in order to free up space in the clinics um, for COVID patients, they would ban the sale of alcohol and cigarettes on top of that. Now, what we know about banning the sale of illicit items is that that does not stop people from using them. It only actually makes the right. use and procurement of those things more dangerous, more expensive. Right. Um, right. And so 
um, just shortly, I think I think South Africa went into lockdown March 27th of 2020. And just shortly after that, there were two cases, one of which was in Cape Town and one of which was in the Alex Township, one of the biggest townships in Johannesburg. The two men's names were Collins Kosa and Petrus Miggles. They were, um, because the, the sale of alcohol was banned, they were essentially caught whatever that means, uh, in possession of alcohol, right? And so the other thing is that the law supposedly made illegal the sale of alcohol, not necessarily the possession and or consumption, but the South African National Defense Force took this upon themselves to essentially police all, you know, use, consumption, possession of alcohol. And so these two men, I think in both cases, they were in possession of uh, of maybe a few beers and were both beaten to death by the um, South African National uh, Defense Force or the police um, for being in possession of those beers, right? And meanwhile, in other more affluent parts of South Africa, there were some restaurants that were still under the table selling alcohol, right? And so we, you know, we saw this one, it, it increased the victimization and violence and brutalization that that poor people and poor black African people in particular experience at the hands of police. But then on top of it, because we know that people continue to buy, the the black market soared. And so now you have people who are already relatively poor spending two, three, and four times what they would have spent on the price of beer and the price of liquor, right? So you have all of these other sort of auxiliary cases of violence that are facilitated by these new ridiculous laws um, that are banning the sale and consumption and possession of alcohol that are adversely targeting um, and overwhelmingly impacting the, the Black population in South Africa. Uhuru, uhuru, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for that. Because You know, these laws sound a lot like the anti-African laws that were put in place by the white nationalist apartheid regime. Mm -hmm. They really show us, I think, what neocolonialism looks like. As African internationalists, we define neocolonialism in short as white power and blackface. So can you explain the neocolonial contradictions of the COVID policy that you saw enacted in South Africa? You know? Absolutely. I mean, in a lot of ways, you know, it's tied to what I, you know, already explained in terms of just an a, a yet another excuse to increase surveillance and the policing. Because I think it was in the case of Collins Cosa in particular, this, this he was not out of his home. So I think it was actually Easter weekend. He was in his home on his own property. I think police were patrolling the neighborhoods and were walking by their home and saw a can of beer. And they actually entered into their home, not only beat him to death, beat his friend to death, beat his wife. And that, and that even in the follow up to that, very similar to the way we see in the U.S., initially the police were found to have done no wrong. Um, then because there was a lot of uproar about the cases, there was a, a, there was a case brought against them. But then ultimately, again, they were found to have done no wrong. Right. And so we see these sort of same practices of surveillance and, and brutality in the U.S. and in the U.S. and in, in South Africa. And as we know, the apartheid regime is one of the most famous for its specific forms of violence and brutality. And they, and they were beat. You know, um, in that case, Collins Coast and Petrus Miggles were beaten to death with Shambox, right? And then we all know Shambox very well from apartheid era South Africa. And, you know, and then again, like I said, um, this idea that making any type of substance um, temporarily illegal for the sake of something, for the sake of some other greater cause does not actually increase safety. And in fact, it did not even, it actually, um, because of, because of being locked down, the instances of uh, femicide, the instances of domestic domestic violence increased dramatically because people were out of work. Um, and we do know that there are correlations between, you know, being stuck at home, feeling as if we are, you know, useless, having nowhere to go, no work to go to. Tensions rise in the homes, right? And so there are all kinds of uh, secondary forms of violence that came out as a result of the imposition of the lockdown and the subsequent laws that they that they impose in order to uphold the lockdown. Mm, mm, mm. That's interesting. That's uh, uh, I really appreciate your analysis right there, especially the way through which you noted the colonial violence led to the 
uh, increased incidence of horizontal violence within the African community over there in South Africa. Because I want to give a shout out to some of the comrades we got working on the ground in South Africa right now. Uh, Director Tafari McGarry, who I know uh, avidly listens to the show, as well as uh, comrades Zakele and Kondo and uh, so many other comrades. I remember there was a moment in time in which the South African state, the South African police had actually killed Mm -hmm. more people than COVID had killed uh, at the beginning of the uh, pandemic. So uh, I really find uh, this, um, you know, what you're saying here, very interesting. Not only that, but Cyril Ramaphosa, the president at the time, he was the leader of the Mine Workers Union, but he was very, he was complicit in the deals that resulted in the massacre at Maracana, right? And so Mm. the, 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 what would you call it? The faith? or the support that South African people, particularly Black South African people have in Ramaphosa himself in order to think about the greater good of people in the country was already waning. And then on top of that, you know, with the growth of the um, economic freedom fighters, the EFF and other forces on the ground, obviously the PAC has been active for a very long time, but the ANC's popularity, you know, is, is quickly waning for a number of reasons, least of which was Ramaphosa's c- complicity in the Maracana massacres and the way that, you know, the, the COVID pandemic has been handled in South Africa. Thank you for that, Leila. Thank you. I unite. So, for you, the Cuban and Venezuelan responses to the pandemic are examples that we should embrace. What has stood out to you about the Cuban and Venezuelan responses? And can you contrast that a little bit with the U.S.? Sure. You yeah. know, Cuba has, you know, since the Cuban Revolution and remains famous for its medical diplomacy. Um, one of the things that happened very early on in the pandemic, within the first month, I remember there was a a ship that was a cruise ship that was out in Caribbean waters that no one would allow to dock because of the number of COVID cases that were active on the cruise ship. And Cuba, in spite of the blockade, in spite of the, you know, limited resources that the country has because of the decades long embargo and blockade, allowed the cruise ship to dock because of its advanced medical technology and its you know commitment to educating its population they were able to manage and maintain the outbreak on the ship and were able to get people home safely but one of the other things that Cuba recognized very early on was because of the embargo um and because of the way that global capitalism operates you know this this rush to create vaccines was not going to reach the so-called developing world at the same rate and so one of the first things the cuban state did was move to develop their own vaccines and it's interesting because very early on in the development of the vaccine cuba had so few active covid cases that they were unable to test the efficacy of the vaccine because they didn't have enough sick people in the country. Um, and so they had to outsource testing of the vaccines to play to, you know, countries that they have better diplomatic relationships with like Iran. But at the current moment, you know, here we are almost two years into the pandemic. Cuba's, Cuba has developed two successful vaccines and more than 90% of Cuba's population is vaccinated. And And what's important about that is that there is no forced vaccination in Cuba. So 90% of the population in Cuba is voluntarily vaccinated. And, you know, you can look at that in comparison to what has happened in the rest of the world and the hole that is the U.S. Um, And in, you know, in Venezuela there, in the case of Venezuela, there were some very early cases, like there was a six-month moratorium on rents um, that was later extended. There was a six month imposition where the government disallowed anyone to be fired or to lose their job. They could not be evicted from their homes. The clap boxes, which are, which would be, I guess would be the equivalent, not even the equivalent, but would be, would be akin to kind of food stamp support um, in the U S was extended to the majority of the population. Right. And so there were, you know, very real measures put in place very early on in the case of Venezuela to make it possible for people to lock down. Right. So you know, when people start thinking about, do I stay home or do I keep my job? And keep my job is about, do I continue to, to be able to feed myself and clothe myself and house myself? The Venezuelan government took that 
took that question away from the people, right? They said, oh, you don't, you, we want you to stay home. We know that because of, because of the embargo that's imposed on Venezuela, we don't necessarily have the resources to deal with a major outbreak. So we need to do our best to contain this as early as possible. And how we do that is by incentivizing people to stay home. And what we do in order to do that is to let people know you will not be homeless, you will not go hungry, and you will not lose your jobs by staying home, right? And so this you know, for me, what I saw in the difference between that and what happened in the U.S. and even in the case of South Africa was that there was a value that was placed on life, right? As opposed to, you know, the ways that ne- neoliberal capitalism continues to place us in jeopardy and requires us to choose being able to make money over our health and safety. And what I saw in the case of Venezuela and Cuba is that they, they just eliminated that choice very early, very, very early on in the pandemic. Ooh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and I and I really appreciate that answer. And I mean, I think um, just like you said, um, you know, just the uh, the difference between the Venezuela and the Cuban response versus versus the U.S. I mean, that's a, a clear distinction between a, a people, a government who's prioritizing the health and welfare of the people, um, and and one that is not. And just the fact that you know these vaccines aren't, you know, they're, they're aren't, people aren't being coerced to take these vaccines, and that shows that these people genuinely trust on um, the government to have their best interests at heart. So, you know, just I uh, really appreciate that um, that emphasis you made. You are listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today we are discussing the anti-colonial turn of Africana studies, the COVID-19 pandemic and popular culture with Professor Layla Brown. All right, Uhuru. So Layla, You recently listened to our show on the role of African intellectuals in the world. What were your thoughts? I mean, you know, this is something that I, I mean, I appreciate you all for having that conversation. And it's something that I I think a lot and have thought a lot about um, for a long time, because I think, you know, the way that we as people who are, you know, consider ourselves to be concerned with African liberation, um, you know, we have, we have different contributions to make and, you know, every, everybody has different roles to play and they're all important, but the role of the intelligentsia is an interesting one, right? Because, because it is both important and also very susceptible to treachery, right? And so, you know, one of the things that I have always been concerned about is making sure that I continue to do work that benefits the people who I say I want it to benefit, and that comes from the people who I say I want, you know, I want the work to benefit. Um, and so, you know, I, I often think about the admonitions of both Kwame Ture and Kwame Nkrumah when they, you know, they talk about, you know, what our role and our responsibility is, and that one, of, and one of the main ones is to not fall victim to the sort of petty bourgeois trappings of of what intellectual life particularly in the US academy can do because it can it can make it really easy to lose your commitment to what you are supposed to be doing right and so for us you know those of us who consider ourselves you know revolutionaries people who want to bring about uh socialism identify as a pan africanist we are, the work that we're supposed to do is is to facilitate that process of liberation and so we're always supposed to be observing documenting the world as we see it but we're also supposed to be thinking about you know what are the i don't even want to refer to them as mistakes but what are the the cases that we can learn from where are the places that we don't need to reinvent the wheel and where are the places where we perhaps need to reevaluate and that's that's really supposed to be our role our role is not to as the US academy would have us publish books and create a a, a cushy lifestyle and that and that's very very much an easy thing to do and you know, I'm not necessarily you known people who make that who make that um, <laughs> who make that choice. But if you consider yourself to be, you know, a revolutionary, um, your role and your responsibility is to always be thinking about writing about contemplating revolution. And that's why I will say this. I don't know if you all, you know, want to keep this in or not, but that's one of my issues with the with the with the recent obsession with Afro pessimism in the U.S. Academy. Um, one of the things that Afro pessimists like to claim. Uh, speak on it. Speak on it. Speak on it. <laughs> Here's my. I mean, the the one of the primary proponents of it is he's a performance studies scholar, right? And and so what I will say is that his writing is very interesting and intriguing and is dramatic and is entertaining 
Um, and so like, you know, when my students come to me and they're, and they are intrigued by it and it speaks to them, um, you know, I told them like, it makes sense that it speaks to you because it's, it's easy to read, but it's problematically nihilistic in a lot of ways. And I think that what, what I find problematic about Afro-pessimism is their constant claim that it is not prescriptive. And that is not the work that we do as African Black revolutionary scholars, we are we have a responsibility to do prescriptive work, right? And that doesn't mean that we know exactly what to do, but we have a responsibility to be trying to think our way out of our current predicament. It is not only our responsibility to describe, and and even the notion within Afro pessimism as a field that you know we got to blow up the world. Afro pessimism is not the only field of thought that thinks about the fact that we need to blow up this shit and re- that's that's what a theory of revolution is. You can, a, a theory of revolution is change, and that in order to have profound change, you got to get rid of the sort of profound foundations that we that are already in existence, right? And so I, you know, I just like to remind my students that there are other schools of thought that allow us to think about getting rid of everything as it is and allow us to think about creating something anew. For me, that's Pan-Africanism, right? For me, you know, as a member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party, GC, our, our objective, so what we, we understand Pan-Africanism is as, is as a political objective, which is the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. And we also understand that that objective not only benefits people on the African continent, but it benefits those of us in the African diaspora. And that for us, Africa is primary, right? As opposed to you know, the way I, 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 you know, I see Afro-pessimism as a field of thought is very U.S. centric. And that's, you know, another place where I have a, a big issue um, with it as a field of study. And so for me, you know, I constantly take, you know, that I'm, I'm constantly trying to think about the work that I'm supposed to be doing in order to envision a better world for us and our people. So Layla, there's been a significant internationalist turn in Africana studies, the discipline that you and Masamela both teach in. As well, there's been a concurrent resurgence of internationalism and all African solidarity. You write about some of this African unity in your work, namely linking the struggles in the U.S. to Venezuela. Can you tell us a little about that? Sure. I mean, let's see. My first... Okay, I, I'm going to take it back even more than that. So I am a graduate of North Carolina Central University. I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina, and I spent 13 years in Durham between NCCU and undergrad and Duke in grad school. Um, and one of the things that struck me very early on, so I was a Spanish and history double major in undergrad, and I had this professor, Afro-Mexican professor, his name is Marco Polo Hernandez Cuevas. He is actually now since relocated to Venezuela permanently. But I remember when I was an undergrad, he used to bring Chucho Garcia to campus a lot. And at the time, like, I didn't really know the significance of, you know, who he was and what was happening. But I remember um, when I started contemplating going to grad school, because my parents are members of the AAPRPGC, I grew up spending a lot of time. We, my, my father has been to every African Liberation Day that has happened in the United States, in, in D.C. since 1972, I believe. 72, 73 um, was the first year. Um, and so, you know, I spent a lot of time in DC and I remember in about 2008, I was trying to think about what I was going to do my dissertation research on. And I was at Howard and I stumbled on this conference, what's up with Venezuela now? And I remember walking into the Blackburn Center and there were being, there were all these Afro-Venezuelan people talking about the Bolivarian revolution and what, and how Hugo Chavez had changed the sort of material conditions of, of Afro-Venezuelans you know, in their lifetime, right? And I remember people saying things like, when I started going to Venezuela, people saying things like, before Chavez, like politics was a thing that politicians did. Like we, you know, we as everyday Venezuelans didn't think about politics in that way. But one of the things that I really appreciated about what happened with the Bolivarian Revolution in Venezuela, um, so I didn't mention this, but the first time I went to Venezuela was in 2011. And we know Chavez passed a couple years later. Um, but when Chavez first came to power in 98, the Bolivarian Revolution was definitely a populist movement. It was left of center, but not socialist per se. And it was after the 2002 coup, when, Bol- when uh, Chavez was ousted, that he recognized who his base was. And that his base was primarily the African indigenous peoples of Venezuela. And it was largely women. 
And, you know, at that point, you know, he started really take, thinking about, okay, what does it mean to build a socialist, you know, revolution, what he called 21st century socialism, but what does it mean to do that and not replicate some of the same mistakes that the Cuban revolution did, right? Because in the case of Cuba, while the revolution meant it, it immediately changed the material conditions of, of people of African descent, largely the conversations around race were not central, not a, not even allowed early on in the in the case of the Cuban Revolution, and this is something that you know uh, Fidel Castro later even you know he he takes responsibility for, and he says you know we didn't necessarily make all the right decisions about that. Um, and one of the reasons the ways that we see that is that in ninety eight when the Soviet Union falls and Cuba no longer has the financial backing that it did before, those same types of racial tensions that existed pre revolution start to resurge because the attitudes and the notions about, you know, racial disparities weren't necessarily dispelled. The material conditions disallowed it, but once the material conditions changed, then those attitudes resurfaced. And so what I saw in the case of Venezuela and even Chavez, even under Castro's mentorship was that, you know, as they were pushing the the Bolivarian revolution to the left, they needed to take these questions about race and gender more seriously. You know, and I've been traveling back and forth to Venezuela off and on since 2011. Um, My most recent trip to Venezuela was actually last year in July for the Peoples of the Americas um, Conference. And one of the things that I was really impressed by was that there is an ongoing thread. And then the year before I went to a conference uh, in Caracas as well, but there is an ongoing conversation about the particular role of people of African descent in building socialist movements, people on the left, right? And so not exclusively these questions about culture or, um, you know, some of the more superficial ways that we think about race and politics, but in particular, what does it mean for people of African descent to be thinking about building socialism in the world? And obviously Venezuela is not only thinking about this in relationship to people of African descent, but they're also indigenous populations, also in, in all kinds of other forms of configurations. But one of the things that I have observed and that I will argue is that I think in the case of Venezuela and Cuba, what we see is that in countries where they are attempting to build socialism, people of African descent overwhelmingly fare better, right? And so we, so for me, it's just yet another testament to the anti-Black, anti-African nature of capitalism, of, of you know, this sort of extractive practices of capitalism and these forms of accumulation that just don't, they don't, they will not result in a better way of life for us and that we have to continue to look as imperfect as they are to the examples where people are attempting to at least experiment with what socialism means and what it means to think about that in relationship to these, you know, very old questions about anti-Black, anti-African racism. Oh, yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Now, we've talked about this a little bit already in this show about the significance of the anti-colonial term in the broader field of Africana studies that you and I are a part of. Why is this turn important and why is it important that we remember this turn as linked to the African revolution of the 1960s and not some of these more, you know, uh, petty bourgeois intellectual, you know, poet things. I mean, one of the things you point out here is that the connections with Venezuela amongst African people are grounded in politics, right? In, in, in overturning the colonial capitalist base of uh, of which we have uh, you know uh, labored against for you know 600 years it's not simply you know the connections between reggae music and cumbia or something like that which mm-hmm. surely is there and and is and is interesting right but but at the at the center of your argument was one about politics and one about you know revolution and and remaking the world that way because honestly some of that other stuff in it's really just without this that that argument for me just becomes you know reformist you know, how can mm-hmm. we sur- survive as better colonial subjects you know mm-hmm. uh, and, and I, I mean you see it I mean I don't want to rant too much but you see it you know you you know there'll be books about how African enslaved Africans made dresses as a as a retreat from slavery like making a dress going to going to going to free you from slavery 
You know, and, and you know what I'm talking about. And it's generally a, a, a white a liberal uh, scholars, but 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 many of the African scholars have been trained from the same perspective. It's true. It's true. I mean, you know, I'll, I will also say that that was something I also appreciated very early on about, um, you know, you all have already mentioned I'm trained as an anthropologist, right? And anthropology is the handmaiden of colonialism. We all know that. Although all of these um, disciplines, you know, have played their role in maintaining it. But, you know, the the back to the, the question that you asked, the connection to making sure we understand what this term or this return, as you have phrased it, um, to a particular kind of anti-colonial, anti-imperial politics is is what is what from from my understanding where the discipline comes from, right? Where the where the where the necessity of studying black freedom struggles in the it, it was focused in the US, but comes from it it comes out of this particular moment in the 50s and 60s in the US where people were also looking internationally, right? I mean, you know, Kwame Nkrumah came famously he was he was at Lincoln University he he consciencism would not be his sort of philosophical opus without his time that he spent in the US studying as a student and being able to link these struggles and and I would would be remiss to even mention that it wouldn't even be that without his mentorship of Kwame Ture later on and the kind of struggles and battles they had over thinking about the connections between people on the continent and people in the diaspora. Um, so, I mean, that's a, that's a very important, um, it's not even a connection to make. It's, it's a, it's a truth to remember. Right. Um, and I think that that even goes back to your earlier question about what our role, what is the role and the responsibility of, of African intellectuals is to remember that these connections and the, and the, the service and the duty that we're supposed to be providing um and that we don't do this shit on our own i mean you know one of the things i'm always appreciative about is that because i went to school because i went to grad school where i grew up i remained grounded in the communities where i came from and so there was never this moment where there was a disconnect between what i was working on and who i was accountable to and that people who I worked with were, were very invested in my quote unquote success through doctoral studies. But it wasn't just about them being able to say, oh, Layla will have a PhD. It was about what I'm supposed to be able to do with this. You know, and to your point about the sort of cultural studies, this is the point I was going to make earlier about anthropology. One of the things that I noticed very early on when I went to Venezuela is that one of the reasons why the Afro-Venezuelan population is so adamant about having a conversation about their role in the politics of the state is that so much of what has been written, codified in in culture, in, I mean, I'm sorry, in the context of the country in general, is that is that black people provide culture, right? They provide fun, they provide all these other things um, to the nation state, but they are not a part of the the specific political historical trajectory of the country. And that's a fight that they are constantly waging, that we contribute more than tambores and arroz, right? Like we 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 have more to contribute than 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 drums and food and music and whatever. And all that's good and fine, right? Like it's it's part of who we are. It's how we you know we have the freedom to do that and exist as full and realized human beings, but there's also more to our lives in that, and that we have something to contribute beyond the sort of ways that people want to take advantage of our cultural production. Oh, oh, yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. And, you know, you actually talked about something that I had hoped to talk about a little bit later, but I just want to just note that much like you, I went to school for my doctoral studies within the community uh, and maintain constant connections to the community uh, of which uh, I emerged out of, you know, as a young uh, African working class uh, intellectual. In that, I really felt a drive to make sure that I was completing really relevant uh, political projects uh, as a part of my uh, studies so that I can help to answer some of the questions that are really needed for the advancement of the uh, African nation, for the advancement of uh, African uh, liberation. And yeah, so I just really want to uh, uh, unite with really, really that sort of urgency that even informed uh, and continues to inform so your own research because, you know, it, it, it really shows, it really shows. So I really want to just uh, so salute your work, uh, really as an African working class, an intellectual scholar. I appreciate yeah. that. 
You are listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today we are discussing the anti-colonial turn of Africana studies, the COVID-19 pandemic, and popular culture with Professor Layla Brown. So Layla, Chairman Amali Chatella of the African People's Socialist Party has defined this moment of imperialist crisis as the uneasy equilibrium. For 600 years, African people have served as a pedestal for the material wealth and advancement of Europe and the white world. As we rise up, things become shaky for them. That is the basis of their own crisis. January 6th represented that. In his book titled The Uneasy Equilibrium, Chairman Amali Chatella notes that the superstructure of colonial capitalism reflects this crisis. There are a resurgent number of films about superheroes from the past, These films represent a nostalgia for earlier periods of colonial capitalism. Meanwhile, dystopian and apocalyptic films and TV shows have increasingly reflected our present. So I know you're interested in these sort of films. So let's ask you, how do you see popular culture reflecting a yearn for the heyday of colonial capitalism? I do not, by any means, want to um, conflate what I truly understand socialism to be with Bernie Sanders. (laughs) But I think it is important to think about the fact that prior to Bernie Sanders' um, candidacy, you know, it, it was not a word that was that was really popular in the American lexicon, right? Like people, it's not a phrase that people use now through, through all his misunderstandings and whatever. It has entered into the lexicon, right? And so there's more and more conversation. I think, you know, younger people in in the U.S. in particular, all over the world, but in the U.S. in particular, are seeing that, like, the, the promise is boom. Like, this meritocracy is a lie. Like, this, it ain't got to do with how hard you work. It, it, none of this stuff, right? And so I think that there is an openness. And I think we even see that. On the African continent, right? Like in the case, like right now, you know, there are great waging in Burkina Faso and Mali, in in Guinea, right? We, you know, we we constantly see these sort of um, uprisings where people are, you know, people are fed up, and I think that that is reflected in some element elements of popular culture. I think that you know that's part of the reason why Squid Games. You know, I can't even talk. That is part of the reason why Squid Games was popular. You know, however you want to evaluate it, it is a critique of what it means to do anything for money and to and to sacrifice our humanity for money. Um, and so I do think that, you know, I really like I tend to like um, zombie apocalypse type films and vampires. But I think one of the reasons why I like them Vampires, in a lot of ways, um, have been for a long time. I, zombies and va- vampires have, in a lot of ways, for, for a long time, been associated with like this notion of walking dead, right? The notion of being alive but not really living, and just sort of being a leech um, in in certain types of ways. But that I think that they they contemplate what the the, the general human condition. Right? I don't necessarily think that all these films are thinking particularly about the African predicament in this, but they are thinking about the human condition. And what will we sort of devolve or perhaps evolve into when the traps of, when the trappings of capitalism, right? When these ways that we currently exist are cease to be options. Um, and I do think that we see a counter to that in the kind of superhero genre where people are like, you know, they're trying to take us back to 1940s, which is a weird time to want to take us back to. But they want to take us back to these moments to celebrate, you know, American, I don't know, greatness. And I, I think obviously that's 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 a preoccupation that white Americans have with no longer being great, whatever that means to them. Um, but I, I do appreciate the the tensions that are currently arising in popular culture that are trying to get people to at least ask some questions about, is this the only way that we can exist? Oh, horror, horror. Yeah, thanks for that. Because, you know, one thing that I've actually noticed is that in this return towards trying to remember a moment when the U.S. was quote-unquote great for whatever that means, like you know, that the colonial capitalist superstructure, right, Hollywood, has begun to make place for Africans in that. Mm. You know, I got I got a lot of pushback for me not really liking that film, The Harder They Fall or something mm. like that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it took the name from The Hard They Come. The Hard They Come was clearly an anti-colonial film. And and it was clearly a critique of 
you know, the Western genre uh, in sense of which these films have been dumped into uh, Jamaica, the Caribbean and other uh, African communities really to reinforce the dominant ideology coming out of the U S and you see that in the film. But I mean, in this film, basically you just get the fact that just, you know, you get to imagine the West and all its treachery as also African. And Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's also part of uh, the culture that's being produced by uh, colonial capitalism as well, as well as other things, which, you know, some people uh, uh, might not like this critique, but the emergence of the Black Panther, right? But mm-hmm. but black, but but in this sense, the Black Panther, you know, is 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 using his skills to help defend, uh, you know, the biggest imperialist uh, country uh, on the, with the face CIA of the earth. And yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so, and, and this ain't no diss. I mean, we, you know, you know, rest in peace to, 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 to the brother. He's an excellent, excellent actor. And, mm-hmm. and I mean, you know, I mean, Idris was in that other movie and everybody loved Idris. <laughs> yes, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an Idris lover. I'm an Idris lover. I'm, I also I'm appreciate Idris Chadwick lover, Boseman. Sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Ch- I love Chadwick. I love I love Idris. You know they you know they all got the race of who gonna be the next Denzel, right? But uh, <laughs> they walk like him and everything. So oh so, yeah. So, I, so 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 it's not to diss them, uh, but but it is but it is to raise the the colonial capitalist contradictions. Mm-hmm, exactly. Yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. I will say this though. That's what I. That is one thing that I do appreciate about what pop culture does. I think we we talked about this on our show recently because we did a shoot on no more holidayification and we were talking about uh you know the the idea about these sort of monuments and 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 um days where we celebrate you know big figures. But you know for all of again for all of its um faults, you know films like Blood Diamond or Amistad or you know whatever they are, they have their problems and critiques, but I do think that what they do and I think they continue to do is introduce these bigger these 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 important moments back into popular culture for a new generation to begin to ask questions about. And the, and the responsibility, again, back to your question about what our role is as African intellectuals, is to be ready. <laughs> it's to be ready to feel those questions and point people in other directions that gives them more and better. Right. So we, we take advantage of these kind of pop culture upswings and surges to then actually build momentum. Right. And so like, and I get in general, I think that that's what an organizer's responsibility is, is that we have to be wait. We have to always be prepared, even in the lulls when people aren't thinking about things so that when momentum builds up and when people are ready to move, we are able to harness that. Right. That's our responsibility. So we have we don't have the luxury of not thinking about these things ever. We we ain't we're you know, we are not all there is. We, we ain't going to be able to do shit by ourselves. But if we're if we remain committed committed and dedicated to this work, then when the masses of people are ready to move, we have some people who have been thinking about these things in the in-between times who can help us move in a in a in a better direction. Oh uh-huh. yeah, thanks for that. I completely unite. So Leila, we really appreciate you having on the show. Uh, we just want to ask you at this point, you know, what new research do you have on the horizon? You know, what do you have going on right now? I understand you have a podcast. <laughs> yeah, so I'm a co host I am a co-host, but I guess I would say one third of the team for the last open intellectual podcast, which, um, you know, we, we do have visuals so we can be found on YouTube, but we can also be found on any other, um, audio platform, streaming platform, but Sharice and I, the co-hosts, um, we are actually going to be doing a conversation series that uh, monthly review press asked us to do recently where we read classic, um, classic texts by, African authors, right? So we're starting with Consciencism by Nkrumah. We're going on to um, uh, Walter Rodney. We're going to read Cabral. I think it was those three uh, in conversation with some other folks. Um, so those things are coming up. Um, in terms of my own research, um, so I'm working on my uh, book project, which was largely which was largely based on my dissertation research. That you know, hopefully, will be coming out in the next couple of years. Um, but right now, I'm actually working on an article. Um, there's this handbook of global politics in the 22nd century, which is actually a really interesting project. Um, they have asked us to write about 
what the right from the year 2120. And in particular, I was asked to to think about this from a Pan-Africanist perspective. Um, And so to think about a a different kind of political lens on on Afrofuturism, right? Not not so much the sort of science, technology, pop culture view, but to think about, you know, for me, I'm thinking about what what would the world look like had Nkrumah and Secretary and, you know, Samora Michelle and Cabral's vision of a United States of Africa happened. What would the world look like, you know, if Chavez and Evo Morales and Castro's idea of Nuestra America or our Americas, you know, if that were realized, right? And so I'm thinking about that in the America sense from the perspective of people of African descent. So that, well, that should be out this year. So that is my immediate project and the book project, you know, let's just keep our fingers crossed and <laughs> hope that I, that I have the wherewithal to keep that going uh, in right. the future. All right. All right. Yes. Yeah, some fascinating work. Please keep us posted about that. You know, where can people find some of your other works? Uh, I mean, yeah. So that, that from the most, everything that I, I try to make sure my stuff is out in the public domain so that um, pandemic of racial capitalism is available on from the European South. That's a, a public, um, what do you call it? What is it called? It's open access uh, publication. I have a few things that I wrote a while ago for the African American Intellectual Historical Society and the Global African Worker. And, you know, I'm on the social medias, but I'm not that active. I'm not like a, I'm not super, you know, engaged on Twitter. I mostly just use it to lurk. <laughs> but I'm on there, Pan African uh, PhD. Say, what say it again? Even though you're popping on there, not so much. I mean, I just be, I, like I said, I just be lurking. Uhuru, Uhuru. You have been listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today we discuss the anti colonial turn of Africana studies the COVID-19 pandemic, and popular culture with Professor Layla Brown. Our theme song, Get Up and Do Something, was written and performed by Elike Ngoma. Thanks to the Black Power Talks production, research, and promotions team, including Jaja Robinson, Empress Livewire, and Ahipsa Panda. You can pray until you faint, but if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. 